Welcome to Ask On This John, sponsored by Motor Easy. My name is Paul Hudson. I'm the motoring editor at The Telegraph. Um, over the next 45 minutes, we'll be taking your car-related questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the man himself, uh, Honest John. Um, he's a car enthusiast from an early age. Um, he's been answering uh, Telegraph readers' questions for 26 years now. So uh, he's written eight books. He's founded his own website. And... Uh, He's just a stalwart of the automotive scene. Um, good evening to you, Honest. Um, good, also joining us you evening. good evening, everyone. <laughs> also joining us this evening is uh, Vicky Parrott. She's a Car of the Year juror. Um, she started her career as the motoring journalist in 2006 um, with Autocar, the well-known weekly magazine. Um, she's since worked across the motoring industry and is a regular contributor to The Telegraph. Um, her specialist subject, if you like, amongst others, is uh, EVs. We've had a lot of questions about electric cars already. Obviously, we'll be covering those, but it's not exclusively uh, EVs. So if you're not really a fan of those, don't worry. There will be something for everyone, we hope. Um, if we go to the first question, um, if I start with you, Honest, um, straight away with electric cars. Um, is it better to wait to buy an electric car until batteries improve or maybe get a, a hybrid car in the interim? Uh, well, it depends what you need it for. Um, they, they are improving all the time. But at the same time, I don't think um, their values are going to diminish very much because what's going to happen in 2006 is something called EU7. And that is going to massively put up the price of anything that isn't an electric car. So it's going to it's going to fill in the gap between um, electric and uh, combustion cars. And so you so if you buy an electric car now, I don't think you need to worry about uh, it, it decreasing in value as technology of batteries improves. But that they will improve. You're sure of that. Oh, they are improving already. Vicky can tell you yeah. about that. Yeah, no, I was going to say over to you, Vicky. Right. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, Honest is absolutely right. The ba batteries are improving quite quickly. But, um, you know, as he says, battery technology is very good right now. You know, you can get a whole host of new cars out there that do, you know, 200 miles in the real world, 150 to 200 miles, and they're quite affordable these days. We're beginning to see parity in terms of costs on a new EV. Um, I think there are cases in which I'd say maybe it is best to wait. If you're a really high mileage driver, the infrastructure is still not really there um, for kind of rapid charging as easily as it is with petrol and diesel, certainly. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, just to sort of to echo honest, yeah, it depends a little bit on your lifestyle. But um, yeah, I think for a lot of people now is a good time to go EV, given the government grants, that kind of thing. But yeah, it's all about what you need, really. Yeah, there's obviously another question that's been in the news this week about um, how many cars are actually qualified for the government grant. I think it's only 13 at the moment. Um, maybe you can highlight that, Vicky. It, it is, do you think that the cost will come down as batteries get cheaper? Yes. Well, I mean, it's a, it already is. Um, uh, most of the sort of manufacturers that, you know, you see in interviews and things, the bosses are already saying they're expecting to see batteries Batteries are dropping in value now by about 10% um, each year to manufacturers, hence the cars are coming down in price. You've got cars like the Skoda Enyaq, so the lower entry level version of that actually is, is uh, you do get the plug-in car grant on that. Obviously the difficulty is that the government dropped the plug-in car grant to be eligible only for cars of 35,000 pounds and under quite recently. And um, I think that was an error personally, but regardless, that does mean there's, there's you know, a limited number of cars that fall in that band. Certainly in the next year or two, you're going to see a lot more cars fall into that price band, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, another question uh, came in earlier. Um, this one for you, Honest. Um, is it worth refurbishing alloy wheels with curb scuffs um, on a car um, prior to selling it to increase the value? It depends how much, how much you want for the car, um, uh, what sort of price category it is, because if it's, uh, if it's a £2,000 car, you don't want to spend... 100 to 200 pounds a wheel refurbing the wheels that isn't going to get you anywhere but if it's a 15,000 pound car and you're going to lose substantially because the wheels are scruffy then you should spend the money yeah i suppose it's the usual um caveats of the overall look as well you know there's no point refurbing the wheels if the seats are tatty for instance so uh as a used car trader yourself you obviously <laughs> know very well what to look for well i used to be a used car trader. <laughs> 
got out of that game. <laughs> yeah. Once you have the knowledge, you never lose it. Um, Vicky, can you um, dive in on this one? Um, what's the best nearly new hybrid petrol or petrol car for 13 grand? It's a Ooh. bit of a wide-ranging question. but <laughs> I think you're going to struggle to get a nearly new hybrid for £13,000, um, I have to say. I think... Um, the closest you're going to get might be I mean, the previous gen Yaris, probably, but that's not going to be really right. really new anymore. Um, I think there are a lot of the new um, Corolla, I think, is a really nice car. That's a really nice hybrid. Um, I also think that the Hyundai Ionic, that's decent. And um, and that tends to be a little bit uh, cheaper to buy used than the Prius, which obviously is kind of a slightly default go to option for hybrids and this kind of thing. Um, but you'll have to say 13,000. You're going to you're going to struggle a bit to get nearly new. But yeah. So I think you're going to have to yeah, honest to you, are you obviously if you're nodding in agreement so you're yeah, yeah it's a bit of an ask yeah it's going to be a previous generation yaris which is not all that previous i mean the, mm. the new one's only been around for how long about a year or something mm. yeah i think it might be wise to sort of just look for it look for a slightly older model rather than nearly new and um you've got some you've got some some good options there like i said i mean um new corolla probably isn't that cheap yet but um you know the current generation prius is a really nice thing and you can probably get one yeah. about 13 by now depending on mileage and yeah so there's there's lots of options out there yeah prices yeah. Are uh, fell off a bit because of um covid and people weren't using taxis anymore and prius with a classic mini cab and yeah sure using yeah. Cabs, so the, the, they, they dropped up um here's one for you honest um the reader says, having a vehicle under three years old, am I obliged to use a main or franchise dealer, or can I use any independent garage as long as I use genuine manufacturer parts? You're not obliged to, but um, you do have to get a very, very comprehensive invoice from whoever does the car that proves absolutely that it was done to manufacturer standards with the correct fluid and the correct part and the correct folders and all that sort of thing. Otherwise, the manufacturer has all kinds of excuses to void the warranty. So, probably better to stick with manufacturer servicing until the warranty's up. Yeah, we're within the warranty period. That's what I was going to say. Uh, and a quick one. I, I suspect I know the answer to this one already. Uh, for you, Vicky, um, what's the best type of car for, for short local journeys? <laughs> um... Well, yeah, I mean, two letters, E and V, I think. I think. Well, an EV does make a lot of sense. You know, I'm not, I'm not an EV zealot. So I do believe that electric technology is fantastic, and I think it's a huge part of the future of motoring. Not, not the only solution, perhaps, but yeah, there are so many people who live a kind of suburban lifestyle, don't do big long journeys, and EVs, you know, for the sake of air quality, for environmental reasons, all that stuff, and they're just great to drive in that sort of driving too. So yeah, I, I would say EV for that kind of lifestyle. Definitely. Okay, and one for you, honest. Um, would a used hybrid Ford Mondeo tow my boat and trailer with a weight of 820 kilos? I checked up on this because we tested them a few years ago, and uh, <laughs> no, they're, they're not homologated to tow. So while a Prius can tow 750 kilos, the Mondeo hybrid was not homologated to tow, so you can't. Yeah, tow. I th think I'm correct in saying that hybrids generally are. Um, have a lesser towing capacity than say the diesel version of the same car is that yeah. correct yeah yeah i mean 750 kilograms is, is a very small caravan yeah and that's all yeah and i appreciate yeah. towing is quite a special subject but you know obviously people tend to go for a sort of big diesel four by four because they're very good at the job yeah for good reason you got some phevs can can do it and the um the suzuki acros and the um I don't know really you say Acros or Acros, but that, that Suzuki mm. um, can pull uh, 1,500 kilograms um, MTPLN, which is the maximum laden weight of the caravan. So when you've got all your crockery and your baked beans and stuff like that, <laughs> that's the MTPLN. Um, and the, uh, the, um, the RAV4 hybrid, uh, self-charging hybrid, can tow 1,600. Um, and that's that's where you that's about the limit yeah uh, sorry uh, honest another one for you moving swiftly on um as cars get more complicated and customer expectations rise um, what future is there for the independent car dealer this is from a gentleman who's a, or a reader who's a, a, a car dealer themselves 
is there a future for independent car dealers uh it's going it's going to get very difficult because there is a lot of chatter today about um one of the big manufacturers is is moving towards a kind of order based system whereby all orders for cars go through the manufacturer websites and they then feed them to uh dealer the dealers who fulfill the orders but the dealers don't don't sell the cars so right all kinds of things like that are happening um but there'll always be space for independent dealers selling older cars because th th that's really what what small dealers do yeah it's, it's on the face of it so it's a very appealing sort of lifestyle but you got out of the the business is is it it's just because it's very low margins at the moment it is difficult to make an honest living yeah it's difficult for mainstream manufacturers to make money on cars so uh, as an independent i can't imagine why anybody really wants to go into that unless you're dealing with you know high end luxury goods um, which you know, obviously the margins are greater but uh, on volume cars i can't really see that um right. one for you vicky uh, is it better to lease or or get a new car on a personal contract plan pcp finance um and also is insurance more if you if you take the pcp option um again it really depends on what you want from the car we are seeing kind of a trend towards people obviously i mean monthly finance payments have been huge for, for a very long time anyway with buying a new car and to be honest the way people buy pcp and leasing is becoming closer and closer in what it actually offers anyway essentially people just have a monthly budget that they want to spend on a car each month and whether they lease or pcp it actually ends up being quite a similar thing given that very few people actually physically choose to buy the car at the end of a pcp contract. right yeah um so um i mean ultimately if you think you might want to buy the car then obviously definitely go for pcp because that gives you the option to pay that balloon payment whereas leasing is just up front you know you're effectively renting the car you don't you don't own it um so i think if you if you're confident you're not going to buy it then you may as well invite you know investigate lease costs as well um it, it varies greatly as to which is which is kind of more affordable in terms of insurance there's not that much difference um, anymore i know i know that at least you know there is um, a bit of a stigma for leased cars being more expensive to insure but to my knowledge they're actually quite similar i don't think it's a huge difference Okay. Yeah, and the same question yeah, to you yeah. same question to you honest before we move on to some live uh, questions we've got loads of them coming in so keep sending them please and we'll get to as many as we can uh, it's um, quite important to take out something called gap insurance if you're on a pcp or a lease because that covers you for a sh any shortfall between a comprehensive insurance payout and what the lessor yes of course good point Okay, let's uh, go into my so I'll scroll down because we've got loads of questions coming. I'll take one of the early ones. Uh, we've got one here. Sorry, folks, my computer's going slow. Um, uh, a reader says, Hi, I'm interested in the rapid rising cost of new cars. A car which cost £33,000 three years ago now costs £45,000. This is pricing cars out of many folks' pocket. Is, is that Honest, what do you think about that yeah, rising cost of cars? It's happening. It's going to get worse in 2026 when Euro 7 comes in. Prices are going to escalate massively. And it's possibly that that's pulling up the prices of used cars because used cars have risen in value very, very significantly over the past few months. So Is that across the market or specific yeah, types of cars? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, not, not, not necessarily the old ones, but nearly new cars, the cars that are close to being new cars have shot up in, 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 in value, in, in price, and people are paying. Yeah. Uh, Vicky, have, have you got any thoughts on affordability? It does feel like cars have got so expensive these days. And I, yeah, again, I'd, I'd agree. I think that is a large part of why used cars have, you know, uh, to go back to the EV thing, especially you know used electric cars that really hold their value remarkably well um and uh yeah i think that's a big part of it but i maybe that's also driving the sort of monthly payment thing again it's why we're starting to see subscription um services as well right, yeah. instead of even pcp this kind of thing um although at the moment it seems to be kind of very much a luxury car type situation but maybe that will actually kind of 
trickle down into the more everyday car and you'll start to see you know 250 quid a month on a subscription basis and and you know be a bit more like that with everything inclusive so yeah so just so it's it's making the car a commodity like a phone and exactly. very few people actually buy it outright yeah yeah, yeah. Um, moving swiftly on, uh, a question for Reader says, I do around 9,000 miles per year. Should I buy electric or hybrid? Uh, oh, sorry, on, on this first. Um, well, it depends where those 9,000 miles are going to be. Because if they're all, in, all locally, um, then electric makes more sense. But uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of distance work, if most of that is, is going to be distance work, then you, you should think about a hybrid, preferably a PHEV. But as, as you say, for the uninitiated, PHEV is plug in hybrid as opposed yeah. to a self charging hybrid. I know there's a bit of confusion. We have a few explainers on our website about the various types of hybrid because I know some people do get very confused. Yeah, um, and but even but PHEVs um, are becoming very expensive. Somebody was asking me today um, about. A, P, a small PHEV SUV, and I thought, can I find one? Can I find one? And the only one I could find is the new Renault Captur um, E-Tech, which is a small PHEV, but it's thirty-one grand. It's really? Small. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a review on the website. I'm, I'm think our reviewer um, was quite impressed by it, but uh, that's still quite a lot of money for a small, yeah, you know, super base. Super, sorry, super mini based SUV, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so time for another question. Um, we've got, um, what, this is a good one for you, Honest. Uh, what car manufacturers do you think will be the winners and losers in the next 10 years? Let's set the whole industry to rights. Well, to, when Toyota and Stellantis get together, I think that's going to be the biggie. And there was a, a, a little indicator on uh, Twitter, it was last week, um, that Citroen brought out an FCEV van. Um, I think it's called a dispatch or something like that. That fuel cell, yeah, that's the Solantis one, yeah. We've got, again, we've got a report on that. Andrew English did a piece about it. Um, and that's quite interesting, just to digress slightly, because um, they're saying that's real world and it's coming very soon. Yeah, well, and Andrew's a big fan of FCEV. I am, mm. too. I just think that's the way to go. But um, the thing is that uh, the Citroen van is the same van as the Peugeot van, is the same van as the Vauxhall van, and it's the same mm -hmm. van as the Toyota van. And that's why Toyota were congratulating them, because Toyota are very heavily into FCEV, not just in cars, but in trucks as well. And yeah, that's the that's yeah, just to add to that, that the um, Stellantis did say that the the, the, the passenger car is, is less than two years away, or about two years away. Obviously, it's difficult to pin down on dates, but um, there's a lot of interest with this. Obviously, you're a fan, Andrew English is a fan, um, and our Toyota Mirai review on, on the website has just had a huge amount of response, and people seem to really love that car. I was so, um, like to like to try. Have you driven it, Vicky? Yeah, yeah, I said I drove it. It's really, really lovely. I really, mm. really like it. It's very good. Yeah, so our review is really impressed, and it's not all the car you'd ever want, really. But usual caveat, where do you fill it? There are, what, 11, 12 hydrogen filling stations in the UK at the moment. It Those seems to have been expensive. overlooked. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as if government mandates electric, yeah. you know, hydrogen. Hydrogen seems to take a bit of a back seat, but it's probably a debate for another day. So, uh We'll do a hydrogen special, I think, next next time around. Um, more questions. So, um, honest, what is the best car for a ninety-year-old with a clean license to enjoy for his last few years of driving? Uh, well, probably an old one, and I hate to say this, but he probably better not get it on a PCP because it's going to leave his uh, beneficiaries with one or two problems to deal with. So, if if yeah, better better than a small older car that's not going to cause a problem yeah, yeah that's something so you mean something less technologically advanced or um well i think i'm thinking i think of my mum and dad who, who both had to stop driving in their 90s and <laughs> there isn't this 90 year old is not going to have much driving time left yeah so better not better not land himself with a you know 
a PCP on a 50 grand Mercedes or something like that. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it's the a, a, a outlay. Uh, one for you, Figgy. What is the best way to move my current car on to get the best valuation? Oh, um, I think, uh, well, in terms of valuation, I think probably, you know, you tend to get the best price for a, for a used car, just selling it privately. Um, so, mm. you know, if that that's kind of seems to be the most sense if you want to make the most money for it, if you want the most convenient option, then you take it to a dealer or, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what honest opinion is, but, you know, chop it in on one of, one of the sort of used car websites, this kind of thing. But you certainly, you, you know, you're going to make the most money by, by selling it privately. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, and, and the best way to get the value is actually just to judge it by what else is on the market, really, I'd say. Yeah, to get maximum value, but honest, uh, presumably just chopping it in one of the used car websites will, will presumably be easier, but you won't get the, the, the best value. Um, the, the, there is a, can I mention names? Uh, I don't see why not. There are a lot of very good companies out there, um, well, there's, including there's, Motor there's, Easy, obviously. So. Yeah, there's an outfit called motorway.co.uk, and what they do is they, they put their cars, the car, your car, out to the trade. Um, whereas the other um, buying outfits um, buy them for their auctions. Yeah. So right. if a car is bought for auction, there's going to be two bites out of the cherry. But if the car is bought directly by the trade, it's one bite. So it's, it, it, Motorway has been very successful. And I've had, I've had a lot of good, good feedback from readers who have used Motorway. So that seems to be the recommendation that's endorsed by the readers so uh, that okay yeah so at this point i should say other internet uh, car buying sites are, are available so uh, but well, as, no, as ever it's a case yeah. of shopping around really isn't it so uh, about the auction companies <laughs> yes well there are many ways to sell and buy a car but uh, we cover a lot of them on the website um here's a car that's pretty close to my heart honda s2000 um Honest, this reader's got a, uh, an S2000, it's 20 years old now, with 50,000 miles on it. Um, he says over the last few years, that is, it has increased in price. Will it continue to do so? Yeah, probably. I mean, Vicky can um, answer this as well. But I used to find that um, the original S2000s had no steering feel at all, and they had very revvy engines. So you had to rev them to six seven thousand rpm feet. yeah what an engine though. what an engine but 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 you couldn't you couldn't steer them so i found them quite scary because i like to be in touch mm. with what i'm doing um and they got better later on so i would favor a later s2000 over an early s2000 but because the early s2000 was the original then it may well be that that is a better investment yeah vicky any thoughts on that up in value i think that sort of quite purist naturally aspirated engine i mean i'm with you paul i love that engine i remember driving mm. a facelifted one and i think it's you know it's got like a 9000 rpm red line it's absolutely yeah that's right love yeah. It. absolutely love it and um yeah i didn't have when the vtec comes in it's just <laughs> yeah fantastic just just a great car so mm. and i think that that sort of thing you know it's it's um i think yeah it's only going to go up in value i would imagine probably quite slowly um you know the, mo the modern classics tend to be a bit more kind of um mm. gradual in that kind of thing but yeah if you think about what a car like that might be worth in 10 years time when potentially you know ev hydrogen and alternative fuel will be dominant then you know it's only going to kind of go up in a peer i would imagine yeah kind of at this point i'd just like to stress for for people who aren't aware that there's a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars in 2030 but not on the sale of all cars so if it, an existing car will still be able to be sold while it's still uh, a running going concern so uh, just to clear that one up um here's a good one uh honest for you um what can be done to help protect an older uh, particularly pre-2000 car from the adverse issues caused by ethanol in fuel if only if you only drive a limited mileage so obviously no. ethanol was five percent now ten percent of pump yeah. fuel so uh don't fill is there anything it, don't fill it up because um but ethanol has a high moisture content and what happens is the moisture content of it emulsifies in the fuel and you get little globules of fuel blocking jets blocking fuel ways so that's that's why that's why it's a problem that's why it's a problem on on lawn mowers that have been left over the winter um that's why they that's why they block, get blocked up and don't work 
So one thing to do is never, if, you, if you're doing a, a small mileage, never fill your car more than a quarter full with fuel. Right, OK. Um, That's good advice. There's something that's just popped up on the screen by the side. Um, a, a viewer said, uh, use super grade E5. That's uh, 99 Ron E5 ethanol fuel. Well, apparently, um, it's, it's going to become, 10% is going to become mandatory from October. It already is in Europe, and we're behind the curve on that, because I think it was supposed to be introduced uh, 2015, 2016, and for whatever reason, it's never really sort of become the norm in this country. But I think throughout the rest of Europe, it's pretty well a uh, standard issue. I don't Correct know me if I'm wrong. I haven't driven abroad for <laughs> quite a while, obviously. I don't know how true it is, but... Um, Apparently, ESO uh, Super um, is graded as E5, but doesn't have any ethanol in it. I right, don't, okay. I don't know how that's possible. I don't <laughs> know true, but I'm just saying apparently. Apparently, um, yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Vicky, any thoughts on ethanol in fuel? I don't think I've really got much to add to, to, to what John said, to be honest. I think... Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be more of an issue for particularly like older classics and that kind of stuff. I think that I think that the E10 fuel might be a bit more of an issue for them. But yeah, certainly I've heard the same thing to do with the moisture content. And it's it's particularly as again with really old cars, like if they're left sitting for a long time, as often classics are, then, you know, that's the sort of thing you need to avoid. But yeah. But it doesn't actually damage the engine. Uh, that's I think we need to make that clear. I mean, yeah, car, it, cars will run happily without modification on that fuel. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every, it, every car that runs on 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 yeah, it will run on E10 or whatever, absolutely fine. But um, there are, I think, the problem is half the the problem is the questions are, haven't really been answered as to what happens if you run that fuel in an older car for a very long time, this kind of thing. So there's just a few questions over, you know, older stuff really. Modern cars should be absolutely fine. I thought, but, yeah. You could run them on um, lawnmower fuel. Yes, yeah. the brands of lawnmower fuel are quite expensive, but uh, they are completely ethanol free. Mm -hmm. uh, and another question I, honest do you like a Porsche Macan don't you I think I'm right in saying yeah. that yeah. Um, if mileage wasn't an issue where would you put your money uh, petrol or diesel um, I would go I'd still go for petrol because even though the Macan diesel is a nice thing the petrol versions are, are much nicer but not the two litre one wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, I think the V6 is, is the one to go yeah. for, yeah, definitely. If, if you're buying a Porsche, I mean, yeah. you know, there's, there's no point skimping on getting a Golf GTI engine in it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's slightly disparaging. But uh, I think if you're going to get a, a petrol engine, go for the V6, why not? Uh, Vicky, yeah. any thoughts on that? Really nice thing. I do really like the diesels too, I have to say. I think for the right, you know, if you're doing quite high miles, I know they said mileage, no issue, but I still... I still really like a decent, like lovely V6 diesel engine. You can't really knock it, and um, you know. True, yeah. That... It's uh, uh, sort of a, a, yeah. It's a bit of a shame that sort of diesel's been quite so demonised. I think, but um, yes, given with mileage, no option, all that stuff. I I definitely go. Pay. Yeah, I I think it's horses. Of course, it's a couple of years ago, well, probably long ago now, three years ago. Um, I did a lot of miles in uh, sort of you know, throughout most of Europe, particularly in Germany. Lots of high mileage. I had a, a V6 engine, Mercedes E Class Estate, and just one thing: it was perfect. You're doing high mileage, comfortable, big diesel. It was doing you know, on on autobahn. It was it was still doing best part of 50 miles per gallon. Yeah. You know what's not to like? So there is a future for diesel. So uh, yeah. E3, uh, E350D wagon is one of one of those. Cars. Yeah, that's that's the one. Yeah, exactly. car, yeah, one of my favourites. 400, yeah. 400 is unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 you have yeah, expensive yeah, taste, so, uh, <laughs> um Moving on to another question, uh, one for you, Honest. Uh, my Mazda 3 has a digital service record. If I have it serviced at an independent garage, can they add details of the service to the digital record? They won't. Do you know? They won't. No? No, they won't. So it has to be a franchise dealer to... Yeah, it's their central record if you're servicing. You can... You can um, you can print off the details of, of, of the services, but they're not going to centrally um, record um, Tom, Dick and Harry servicing your car. They're not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, and one for you, Vicky. Uh, what are your thoughts on the residual value, um, that's the used value, say after about six years, of cars you buy now with a manual transmission? 
given that uh, mid and premium brands seem to switch to automatics pretty much across the board. So that's quite an interesting one, actually. I think, um, I, to my, to my, in my experience, actually, most people are still more than happy with a manual gearbox in the UK, particularly, you know, and Europe. I, I don't think it's a, that big a problem, but yes, new cars are definitely going closer to, you know, auto gearboxes kind of everywhere, um, and. I don't know. There might even be an aspect of a manual being quite desirable to a, to a certain extent. There may be some people that prefer it, but um, like like almost well, like a classic car because you know well, obviously another point is with EVs you yeah. can't buy a manual EV. They're all automatic by definition. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think um, it depends a bit on the car. I mean, for instance, if you're going to buy you know a half a half sort of hot hatch type thing or a proper hot hatch, then a, you know, manual pretty much I think is always going to be more desirable to an extent. And um, yeah, but the everyday kind of, you know, if you're going for your E350D, then obviously it's auto only anyway. So, yeah, I'm not I, I think probably autos will be will hold their value slightly better, but I don't think it's going to be a huge problem. Yeah, brilliant. Um, honestly, you got any thoughts about that with manual gearboxes against automatic? Do you, do you well, think manuals might actually appreciate in value? Different types of automatics. Um, and I, still, I personally prefer um, torque converter automatics and I think they've become massively better and you can get um, eight, and nine, eight, and nine, eight and nine speed torque converter automatics and they they do the job for you that you, you, you don't need to think you, you don't even need to paddle them they'll just do it better than you could so I I, I, I do quite like them mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, here's an interest, interesting question. Actually, somebody says, uh, "What is the point of a self-charging hybrid? Surely, there's a lot of wasted power compared with a vehicle using petrol or diesel alone." Do you think about that, honest? Well, it's what they do is they regenerate. So they regenerate when you lift off or when you're going down a hill or that sort of thing. So you're not using the engine to put um, to put juice into the battery. The, you regenerate to put the juice in the best and that's and that's why they achieve um economy that is either on a par or slightly better than diesels yeah i think there's also the, the point to add is um obviously urban areas if there's uh, you know clean air zones or um ev only zones you know, which are coming um obviously you can you can drive an electric power only usually in a off charging hybrid uh not not very far <laughs> and yeah they only that's the caveat yeah okay about a mile or so um, mm. as short as that um but um phevs that have got yeah uh, sorry, i was thinking of plug-in hybrids so uh yeah that, that have got a recharge button then you can actually use the engine to put juice back into the battery and you can get it up to about 80 percent battery and in the uh, cross that gets it up to about a 35 mile range that you can put in yourself while you're driving along that does yeah that's quite useful isn't it that does tend to affect the fuel economy you get though slightly it's yeah it drop, drops of one or two miles per gallon so it'll drop from about 42 to about 40. Uh, <laughs> i've got one one for you here vicky um you're, you're renowned as a keen driver um, we all are but uh <laughs> You particularly so um what has been your biggest surprise in driving uh for instance a car you didn't expect to drive well but did i mean should put a time limit on this say the last 10 years anything that you really thought was amazing and my biggest surprise i think is the alpine a110 which i am absolutely besotted with Ooh, yeah. and, um, mm. i mean i knew it would be good because well i mean looking at you know, what it is it's a it's a you know it's a virtually hand-built aluminium frame car it's you know it's, it's really something special but you know you're like oh you know there's a Renault engine and all of this stuff you don't know quite how good it's going to be but I mean it's off the scale absolutely fantastic um, one day I'm, I will own one it's one of those cars you get in and it's just instant instant kind of it feels like you've been it feels like it's your car it just everything feels natural yeah, yeah, how yeah. Life is. it's a simple just wonderful yeah they absolutely absolutely nailed that car it's just just oh. I only had a very brief drive in one, but it is, it's one of those, it's just almost like the original Lotus Elise, it's what I call telepathic, it yeah. just does exactly what you want oh, it to. And the, exactly, it's just, lovely. you don't even need to think about it, it just does what does what you want it to do, I've, I've driven it on track and on road, I've driven it lots, you want the standard one too, I think the standard one's actually better than the S, I think the slightly softer suspension suits mm -hmm. it, 
it's, it's one of very few modern sports cars that feels absolutely spot on for British B roads in rubbish mm. weather and whatever as well, because it's not overly powerful, yeah. it's not too heavy, it's not too big, it's just, you know, it's it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Honest, is there anything that surprised you over the past few years? I wish I, wish I really wanted to drive that car. <laughs> I haven't been near one. So. Yeah. Uh, I'll get onto them and get one to you. Yeah. <laughs> long um, term, long it, term test car, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, honest, one for you. Um, I want one last hurrah. Nice family car before I'm forced down the EV route. Should I get a Jaguar SVR 5 litre V8 or a Porsche KNS? Which is somebody with expensive tastes, but uh, Jaguar SVR or Porsche KNS? Oh dear. Um, neither of them. The SVR is the E pace, isn't it? Um, I believe. I, I, I'm not sure. Is, isn't it um, an, an, an F pace? Isn't it a version of the F pace supercharged? So I think it's I think it's the E pace, but we'll have to confirm that. But it's it's got a five litre V8 anyway, where the KNS has got a, I believe, turbo V6. But somebody's going to correct me on that one. I've got no idea why you would want the car like that. It just doesn't. <laughs> you know, it just. It doesn't, you know, if you're going to have an SUV for the comfort because you see further and you feel safer and all that kind of thing, why do you want a massively powerful engine in it? It just, it just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, there's a pretty healthy market for those cars, aren't they? Yeah. All the manufacturers are coming out with them. And, well, obviously, you know, the fact we now have a Lamborghini SUV and a Aston Martin SUV, you know, it seems to be sort of like this Ferrari SUV coming as well. So let's not forget. So uh, um, anyway, over to you, Vicky. Um, check your SVR or Porsche KN. Oh, just, just go for a VM. Preference? I mean, just do it. Just get the F pace because, I mean, that engine is, you know, if you want some kind of last hurrah before you go EV or whatever, then, uh, I mean, the, don't get me wrong, the Porsche is, if you want precise handling, if you want really precision handling and that kind of thing, you know, the the, the Porsche is is the best of the, of the sports SUVs. It's really, really lovely for that. But, you know, Jag's supercharged V8, it's just got such a flamboyance to it. It's such, it sounds great. Still really handles really beautifully. Jag's have got such wonderful steering, I think. And um, yeah, but I mean, honestly, if you want something that's just fun, then just go for the Jag. It's got it's got real theatre, but I think the Porsche perhaps is, is a bit less of that. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's one for you, Honest. Um, easy question, well, a difficult question, very short. Um, what are your opinions on Peugeots? Oh, I like Peugeots. Um, uh, I used to I used to buy them. I used to own them, two hundred five GTIs and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I've liked them for a, a very long time. Um, yeah, so I, I, I like them. As simple as that. I had a three. Yeah, I, I think per Peugeot fan clubs in tonight. Because there's another question just come up saying, oh, I've I've had seven Peugeots in my forty four years of driving. Is it time for a change? Well, simply not. Yeah, the thing about Peugeot's was the steering compared to the competition. Peugeot's always had um, better steering. You felt more, you mm. felt more in touch with the road through the steering of a Peugeot. I mean, they might wear their front tires out a bit earlier and that sort of thing, but they were they and um, um, some of the front wheel drive Alphas had that same kind of um, in touch steering. Um, that. That was quite a special thing about Peugeot's. Uh, Vicky, any thoughts on Peugeot's? Hmm. You know, modern Peugeot's, they're doing really good things with their electric cars. The E208, the E2008, they're really, really good things. They're really nice. Hmm. And um, their interiors, I mean, they're just absolutely light years from what the interiors were, you know, eight, ten years ago. It's just such a, such a huge improvement for them. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with with, with modern Peugeots. Um, they're, they're really nice, really good family cars, and they're often quite fun to drive as well. So, um, you know, they're not without a few flaws. The touchscreens are a bit annoying and stuff like that. But, yeah, I like Peugeots. They're good. I think that's uh, not just Peugeots, though, is it? So, <laughs> <laughs> No, to be fair, no. Not <laughs> we, we, we should say, yes. yes. Um, one for you, Honest. Um, you, uh, a while back, you recommended uh, a Toyota, Toyota Avensis Estate um, to a reader. Um, sorry, he had one, and you recommended a Hyundai i40 estate to replace it with. Um, that's um, long in the tooth. Now, what should he replace the Hyundai i40 with? Oh, I see. Oh, right. So, does he want? 
did he want an estate? He, he wants a replacement for a Hyundai i40 estate. I'm stumped. Can I suggest a Skoda I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say Toyota Corolla estate might be not quite as big, but uh, very nice car. You're making sense, yeah. Uh, mm. And it's a hybrid, of course. Yeah. So, uh, oh, we've got a classic car. Um, somebody's got a Saab 93 convertible, um, not been used for about nine months due to lockdown. Um, uh, can the reader take it um, for an MOT because it's not taxed um, and it's on the SORN, such as Geoff Road? notification is it okay for him to take it for an mot it, it, it must be pre-booked so it must be pre-arranged uh, and you must be able to prove that and you must be insured but if you if you do all of those things then you can get it to the mot station but it isn't going to pass the mot if it hasn't been used because there'll be all sorts of things wrong with it so yeah um uh, he's actually goes on to say um are there any things i should be careful of as i drive again after so for so long uh, no, fuel no, tires no, brakes the car needs recommissioning it needs going over properly by yeah so we'll get the mechanic in and give it a once over before driving it i mean uh, uh, it's always better to time your annual service to be at the same time as the mot so you take it in for the service and they service it and they fix anything that they think will fail the mot then the mot it's all done at the same time um, but yeah. any idea of MOTing a car separately from the service is, is asking for trouble. A bit bonkers. Yeah. Uh, and another one for you, Honest, uh, about digital service records. Um, can private owners access that themselves, or do they have to go to a dealer to access the digital service record? As far as I know, they have to go to a dealer, but but it, I don't. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent on that. It will yeah, on the manufacturer. Some of if you're an expert hacker, it might be a bit more possible, I guess. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to like to attend that. Some of them may not. Uh, yeah, because a lot of people are moving to subscriber-based, or, or over the next few years, they will be moving to subscriber-based. And if you've got a subscriber account for your car and you're paying um, on a monthly basis for um, things like the ECU to be updated online via an eSIM card and all that sort of thing, then you must have um, your own access to to the data. Right. Uh, it's another one. Um, do you know anything about uh, Mercedes M-Class, Vicky? Um, uh, this uh, viewer has had a 20 year old, uh, Mercedes M-Class for 20 years. It's been faultless. They're farmers. But they want a younger one. Which model would you suggest? A younger. So presumably that's a, a used <laughs> rather than new. Yeah, yeah. So a, a sort of a younger but still used version of the M class. I would say yeah, up, probably up to five years old. I'm guessing, but uh, um, they don't say. I mean, I think the um, you know the, the the GLC is is a pretty good thing. I prefer the GLC to the GLE, to be honest. Um, I think I think the GLC is a good shout. So if they're if they're keen on the Mercedes brand and that's what they want, I'd say definitely go down that road. Um, the the GLE is bigger and is and don't get me wrong, it's a it's a nice thing, but I think the GLC drives better and um, and also you know certainly when new the GLE felt like it was quite expensive and emissions are quite high and this kind of thing. They've improved it over to, mm. uh, in facelifts and things. So yeah, I'd go GLC, but. You know, don't be afraid to look at some other bands and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Here's, a good one for you. Here's a good one for you, Honest. Um, if I don't want an EV after 2030, can I import a petrol or diesel from mainland Europe? Not a new one. Mm. Because you wouldn't, be yeah. able, you wouldn't be able to register it. Because you wouldn't be allowed. Right, okay. So, you, you, yeah. <laughs> so, it's... so I, I suppose in theory you could import one and drive it on private land, but, it, but to use on the road... You yeah. it, no. All right. Okay. Lots of people thanking Vic for Vicky for her uh, Jaguar recommendation. Drivers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, a quick one. We're running out of time. I'm really sorry, folks. So I've got loads more questions to get through, but we'll do this one very quickly and a few more. Um, my wife needs to replace a Volkswagen Up. What is the best city car? Honest. Oh, uh, Kia Picanto. Or until very recently, Kia Picanto, uh, and, oh. and the basic and the basic one, the, the one liter one, is, is much more fun yes. to drive than the pure, pure, pure and simple. Yeah, yeah. Vicky, what's your favourite city car? 
Um, I think the Kia Picanto is good. I rather like the Hyundai i10 as well, actually. The Hyundai i10 is a bit uh, less kind of uh, sort of, yeah. Well, I suppose the new one, yeah. No, I think, yeah, either the Kia or the Hyundai, you can't really go wrong with it. They are pretty much the same thing, aren't they? The same uh, yep. underneath. So, uh, um, uh, honestly, you probably haven't driven this, but so I'll put it over to Vicky. Uh, what do you think of the Polestar 2? I really like it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Really, really good. It's 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 a surprisingly kind of um, enthusiastic car to drive because it's obviously you know it's it's Model Three territory, so it's kind of executive saloon and and I. That's the yeah, Tesla, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tesla Model Three. Sorry, and um, mm. so Polestar have got um, you know very fancy uh, optional Olin dampers and this kind of thing and. Uh, I haven't driven one without those optional dampers. That's the only thing. Um, but certainly with them, it's pretty remarkable. But yeah, lovely. Love the interior. Love the infotainment. Really good. Very nice. Yeah. And a quick one for you, Honest. Uh, when buying a used car, which would you prioritise, mileage or age? Um, a, uh, you want to get it younger with higher mileage rather than older with lower mileage. Um, in, unless you're sort of talking classic and you're getting into that area, but for an everyday car, um, the the younger it is, um, the less problems you got. The seals won't have failed, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, younger and higher mileage rather than older and low mileage for the same money. Okay, and uh, sorry, I just lost the question. Um, Follow on from that, that, does the number of previous owners really matter when buying used? Well, it matters to other people, it matters to the people you're going to sell the car to. That's the problem. It, it, it shouldn't really matter to you, but it is going to matter when you want to move the car on because they're going to be put off by it. So that applies if the car's been like on a, a, a lease fleet or a, um, has been used as a hire car, it's going to have one extra owner on the on the v5 is that correct well if it's been a hire car it's been driven by everybody which isn't necessarily a bad thing because i used to do very well with x rental fiat's x rental mondeos stuff like that nothing went wrong with them because they've been driven by lots of different people so in the early part of the car's life They've been run in very well because they've been run in by different people, not by somebody driving them the same all the time. So I'm afraid we're over time, but one final question. I'll put this over to Vicky. Um, this view has got up five thousand pounds to spend on a classic. What would you buy? Uh, well, I, I did have five thousand pounds to spend on a classic and I bought an R129 Mercedes SL, which is the sort of boxy shaped one um, that they sold in the 90s. And um, so, yeah, I would I would still recommend that. Um, 5k is pushing it a little bit to get an R129, but you can still find them about. Um, and they're they're just of the modern classics. They've got they're they're very good at uh, withstanding a bit of neglect if you have to let them stand occasionally. Um, and they've uh, they're pretty they're fairly solid mechanically. Just you know watch out for the usual stuff really. Bit of rust. They've got a really bad uh, issue with the autos failing. That's one of the things you've really got to be careful of. But yeah, so I, I would def I would definitely go down down that route. But yeah, there's all sorts of options. Okay. On this stuff, have you got any preference for a five grand classic car? Um, I just look on uh, the auction sites and, and choose one and then miss it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'm really I'm sorry, yeah. folks. We're going to have to round it off there. Um, thank you very much to Honest John and Vicky, um, and obviously you, the audience, for watching. And thanks also to Motor Easy for. Uh, uh, helping us out with this um, issue. Um, thank you all very much, and I uh, wish you a pleasant and restful evening, and all the best. Thank you very much.